Hey church, we're going to do our Wednesday night study, and in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. When we look at that text, you'll notice there's some things about God's, God's name given to us, about Jesus, that's so wonderful. First of all, you know, the Bible says in his name that his name is wonderful which means his name is astonishing, it's exciting, it's, it's a name like no other name. And the Bible says that he is the counselor, which means that he gives us wisdom and, and knowledge, he guides us, he leads us. You know, when you, you look in John chapter, chapter 10, and you read in John chapter 10, the Bible talks about him that he is the good shepherd and he leads his sheep, he guides his sheep. Uh, they don't follow another voice or another stranger, but they listen for his voice. He leads them wherever they need to go. Uh, and, and you notice the Bible says also that he is the mighty God. And when you read that he's the mighty God, that means there's, there's nothing that he can't do. There's no problem we face that he can't uh, overcome in our lives. You know, what, what trouble are, can we, are we going to face in life that the mighty God can't overcome? Uh, what is too great for him? What is too hard that he can't overcome? Notice the Bible says he's the Prince of Peace. He gives us peace in our lives. He gives us peace with God, the peace of God, and peace with God. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. No one else is called the children of God, but, but the peacemakers. The peacemakers are those that have made peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, that is who Jesus is. He is the Prince of Peace. So, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name is called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. He is the Eternal God. That is who Jesus is. This is the wonderful gift that's been given to us. And I love... When you go on further in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, the Bible says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. And, and, uh, and being interpreted is God with us. Now you notice there's a wonderful term, one of the greatest gifts you're ever going to find in the Bible is the term God with us. God with us. That God doesn't leave us alone in this world. We're not to wander in this life by ourselves. We're not to travel on this path without any direction. But God walks with us. He saved us and He leads us and we're to follow with Him. And, and He's going to guide our lives. Uh, and that, that is one of the greatest gifts that we can have is the fact that God is with us. You know, when, when Moses uh, was leading the children of Israel, Israel was so, they wanted so much. They lusted after so many things. They wanted meat, and, and they wanted all the different things that this world had to offer. But that's not what Moses wanted. If you remember, one time the Lord told Moses he wasn't going to go with them anymore. He was going to send his angel. And this is what Moses said in Exodus 33, verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now, I pray thee, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said to him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? For is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. By name. You know what Moses wanted more than anything else? Was that God's presence be with him. That's what he wanted was that God be with him, that his presence go with him as they led the children of Israel. That's what he wanted more than anything else. You know, that is really, when you go to, to the most famous psalm of all, 
uh, though some might say Psalm 1 is, a lot of will say Psalm 23, but listen to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Notice he leadeth me. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's leading. He's leading. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now you could spend years in that psalm, but you'll notice that God's presence is with David, and he's not going to want that God's with him. God's with him. That's what he's praying. That's what he wants. That's what Moses and David wanted, God's presence with them. Now when we go back in the Old Testament, and we look at what God promise, promises his servants over and over again, we're going to see that same promise. And that promise brings comfort to God's people over and over again. Look, look what God promised Jacob. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached heaven. And behold, the angel of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and, the, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all the famines of the earth be blessed. And I'm in Genesis 28, 15. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest, and I will bring thee again to this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. That's what he said to Jacob. Listen to the promise he said to Isaac. The Lord appeared to him and said, Go not down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give thee all these countries, and perform the oath which I swear to Abraham thy father and thy father you know when moses first went over and he saw the burning bush this is what the lord told moses moses said unto god who am i that i should go into pharaoh and that i should bring forth the children of israel out of egypt and he said certainly i will be with thee and shall be a token unto thee and i have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of egypt ye shall serve god upon this mountain what Moses needed and what he wanted was to know that God was with him. What did God tell Joshua? How did he encourage Joshua before they went to battle in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5? This is what the Lord told Joshua. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What did the Lord tell Gideon in Judges 6, 16? And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You know, in our trials that you and I face every single day, what does God tell us in Isaiah 43, 2? When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I think there's a hymn that we sing about that. Um, but you'll notice God says, whatever you go through, whatever you face, whatever trial, whatever, whatever hardship you go through, you're not going to face it alone. God goes through it with you. He's there with you. You know, God told Israel in the battle, in Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, when you're going through those tough battles, when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know, when we get our small groups, two or three, listen to what Jesus said. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You know, Jesus even said, if there's just two or three in a church congregation, or just two or three are gathered together in my name, 
don't think that that doesn't matter. Don't think it doesn't matter if just two or three are there. I'm there with them. You know, in the Great Commission, when the Lord sent, sent his people out to go and evangelize the world, Jesus came and spake unto them, Matthew 28, 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And that word always, always means without variation, continually. I'm always with you continually, without changing. He's with us. And of course, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I love this verse, what the Lord has said to the believers. He said this, and I will pray to the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now notice that the comforter abides with us forever. Even the spirit of truth. You notice that the spirit is always the spirit of truth. And notice whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You'll notice there how Jesus has made that promise. The spirit of truth, the world can't receive him. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then Jesus shows us that he and that spirit are the same. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That wherever we go, the Holy Spirit, he's with us. He's comforting us. But not only is God with us, but you're going to notice in the scriptures that God is also, he's for us. He's for us. Now, in Romans chapter 8, and verse 31, the Bible says this, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Did you notice that? That God is for us. He's on our side. God is for us. And the reason God's for us is because he has saved us. Now notice verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him, us, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, uh, how shall he not, with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it not God that justifies? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that means all the powers of hell, the devils, all of them, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You notice that God is for us, the one that worked our salvation. You know, if you notice how much God loves us, how much God cares for us, he spared not his own son. It shows you how serious our sin is, that God spared not his own son. He didn't spare the angels. He didn't spare the old world, the Bible says. He didn't spare his own son. All that was necessary for our sins. You notice Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, the reason you and I have no condemnation is because Jesus took our condemnation on the cross. He took all the condemnation, all the condemnation of our sin. Now, I know that I read these verses a lot, but that's because they are so special. They are so special to me. They, I think they ought to be special to all Christians, but... Over in Isaiah 53, verses that were written six, seven hundred years before Jesus came. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we shall see him. 
There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised. He is rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He is, was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Boy, all of our sin and our transgressions, all the things that we are condemned and we are so ashamed of, all of our wickedness and things that we are so embarrassed about was laid upon, upon Jesus Christ. All those things that we are so ashamed and don't want anyone to know about was laid upon Christ. All that iniquity. And he didn't open his mouth. He didn't defend himself. All that condemnation was laid on him. And the Bible says the chastisement of our peace. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. All that condemnation was put on him so that you and I would have no condemnation. So you and I could have peace, could stand before the Lord and be righteous, not because of any righteousness we have done, but because He is righteous. Notice, you know, I'm going to go over here to, I want to read Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Notice what it says here. I know our time is almost over. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and re regeneration by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know, there's no righteousness which we have done, but by according to his mercy he saved us. And, and that's what's so amazing. It's not by anything that you and I have done. So many people think that they can go to heaven by, the, by the establishing their own righteousness. In fact, if you go to Romans chapter, chapter 10, and you look at what it says in Romans chapter 10, in verse 3, let me flip over here to Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and being about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Yet we can't establish our own righteousness. We, we can't. We don't have any righteousness that we can establish. We can only establish the righteousness that God has allowed us to have and that is through Jesus Christ by having our sins forgiving and, and turning to Him. But I want to just kind of finish up by giving you some verses here that God is for us. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ is sacrificed for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Ephesians 5 2, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for sweet smelling savor. 1 Thessalonians 5 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we walk, wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once to the holy place, 
having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the, of the true, but unto heaven itself now appear into the presence of God for us. 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the arm, in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. I love 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings with which cannot be uttered. For God is with us, and He is for us in all things. I want to encourage you that remember that God is for us. He has saved us. He is on our side. We can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. So put your... Keep your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to help us through this time. Uh, but I just want to encourage you to continually examine your walk with the Lord Jesus. If there's anything in your life that's not where it ought to be, get those things purged out and, and continue to, to serve the Lord in these times. Uh, I think these are great times for us as Christians. These are great times to serve the Lord, to be shining lights. We live in a dark world. We live in a very dark world. And as this world gets darker, as you live for Christ, you're just going to shine brighter and brighter. These aren't the hardest times to be Christians. I think these are some of the best times to be lights for the Lord. I love you, church. God bless you.